take the roll. Uh, we are recording in Broughton. Here. Chen. Here. Cisneros. Here. De La Cruz. De La Cruz, you're on mute. Delenn. Here. Duran. Here. Ganong. Here. LeBron. Here. Pertula. Here. Stallings. Here. Stoll. Here. The leg. Here. And let me try De La Cruz again. I saw you turn off mute. Here, sorry. There we go. No, terrific. All right, we uh, we have a quorum. All right, very good. Thank you, Dag. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the Board of Trustees. Uh, I'll begin with a call for public comment. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, if you can use the feature to raise your hand, uh, then Dag will be able to know that you want to give public comment. And Dag, remind me what people on the phone on Zoom need to do to exercise that prerogative. We'll, we will uh, enable your mic on this end. Uh, once your mic is enabled, you will need to unmute it, at which point you'll be able to make comments. You'll have three minutes. I'll give you a warning at about a half minute prior to the end of those three minutes. OK. All right, so do we have anyone who would like to give public comment to the board? We do. I see. I see Bridget Graham, uh, or is it Grammy? You can tell me because you have access to your microphone and uh, it's now unmuted. Go ahead, Ms. Thank Grammy. Thank you. It is Bridget Grammy. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for Public Interest Law at the University of San Diego Law School, and I just wanted to briefly. Um, give some remarks this morning. Some of you, I know there's a lot of new board members, especially since I've been able to be there in person and I just wanted to introduce myself as the director of the center. Um, our center is based at University of San Diego Law School and we've been there for the last 40 years. Um, we've worked hard over the decades to institute reform at the state bar. Um, it, my boss, Bob Felmuth, was the State Bar Disciplinary Monitor back in 1988 to 92 and helped to develop what you have now as the State Bar Court. And I personally have been involved over the last six years, particularly with respect to the board's um, uh, governance and the public interest task forces and the deunification and state bar, um, bar exam reform efforts. And most recently, I served on the Access Through Innovation of Legal Services Task Force, and I'm looking forward to being on the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group. So I just wanted to give a, a brief background. I, today, I just want to give two remarks. The first is in support of you, uh, what you'll be discussing later today with the Paraprofessional Working Group to have a new chair and to extend the time to that working group so that they can get really important voices um, to play a, a bigger role in that process. I think that's really important. And I just encourage all of you to continue supporting the work of that really important working group. I know there's been a lot of opposition. I think some of it is valuable and it needs to be heard and they need to be able to take the time to incorporate the opposition they are hearing and the fears that they do have with respect to public protection into account before they make their final recommendation. So I do encourage you to support that motion later today. The second thing I wanted to talk to you about has to do with uh, your improvements that you're looking at to the disciplinary system. And I had to miss your RAD meeting, so I, I missed some of the public comments, but I think you may have heard from someone who had an experience where he's just had a bad experience with an attorney, but just has not been able to get any help either through the complaint process or through the civil process. And it reminded me of an, a model that I've seen in the UK that we were actually looking at recommending with the Department of Consumer Affairs as well, um, where they have an ombudsperson who will take, you know, complaints that may not rise to the level of violating the Business and Professions Code, but yet the, you know, the consumer still has some valuable um, complaint and something that needs to be heard and maybe addressed in a, big, in a different way. And so I encourage this bar to think about that model and I'm happy to work with anyone if you wanted to add this to an agenda for a later meeting um, to think about different models for incorporating, helping people feel like they're heard, that their complaints are being heard and addressed 
um, and also possibly involving consumers. They have consumer panels as well in the UK that I think would be a valuable model for Ms. this Grimmie, farm you have movie. 30 seconds. Thank you. That's really it. I just wanted to uh, offer that as a suggestion and my help if uh, staff wanted to get up for a future meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. We do not have anyone else indicating that they are interested in giving public comment. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you, Chair Soleil. All right. Thank you, Dag, and thank you, Ms. Grammy. Um, all right, next item on our agenda is minutes. I don't see any minutes. Am I missing something, Dag? We, we do not have the minutes. We, uh, the, secretary was unable to, the secretary was able to provide them, but we weren't certain that she was going to be able to provide them. And so we pulled them from the agenda and then she delivered them. But because they were not on the agenda, we'll, we're going to need to approve them at the next meeting. Okay. All right. No minutes to approve today. Next is the chair's report. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, as you know, we have a lot going on. Uh, I want to start with uh, the last administration of the bar exam. When I last spoke to you, uh, we were anticipating the first online administration of the bar exam going forward. And uh, as we know, it has now uh, been completed that was undertaken as an emergent measure by direction of the Supreme Court in response to the pandemic. And I'm glad to say that the information we have tells us that the effort was a success. And I wanna thank the staff and all the trustees and everyone else who contributed to that result. One of the key statistics uh, we know is that 97% of people who were registered to for and eligible to take the exam at the time of its administration were able to upload their completed answers. So that means 3% were not. Um, that is better than the typical no-show rate for the uh, traditional in-person administrations, which have ranged between six to 10% in the last five years or so. So, um, you know, if even one person had a technical problem that prevented them from participating, that's a problem, a serious problem we wanna look at, but in the aggregate, uh, we think that people who wanted to have the opportunity to take the bar examination, despite the pandemic preventing us from offering it in person for most attendees, uh, most applicants, were able to do so. And I think we can be proud of that outcome. Uh, in addition, for the next administration of the bar exam in February of next year, we are waiting for direction on the Supreme Court as to the format in which to deliver that exam. If the court directs us to proceed, proceed with uh, online administration again, we are prepared to put further resources into improving that process, learning lessons from the prior administration and making that as smooth an experience as we can for the applicants. In the meantime, the other accommodation to our licensing function in light of the pandemic, as you all know, is the provisional licensing uh, scheme that the Supreme Court has approved that is now live and operating and Donna will have some more details on that for you in her report. Uh, meanwhile, on the um, policy side, we have a number of policy initiatives going forward. We're going to be talking about a number of them today. Um, first, let me talk about the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group. As directed by the board at its last meeting, the executive committee met uh, recently to finalize the composition of this commission. I want to thank the staff and our board appointments liaisons, Brandon and Christine, for making this happen. Uh, in addition, the board delegated to me the responsibility of appointing the chair of this group, and I'm pleased to announce that Justice, Justice Allison Tucker of the First District Court of Appeal will act as chair of that group. Another important study we have going on is the Paraprofessional Working Group. As you know, our former colleague and trustee, Chris Iglesias was chair uh, and was not able to accept another term on the board. Uh, we have arranged with your approval later today for Justice Iwana Petru of the First District Court of Appeal to chair this group uh, and approval of that appointment and additional, uh, the uh, ability of Justice Petru to appoint some additional members to that group to further its important work is on your agenda for discussion and I hope approval later today. Uh, final policy initiative I wanna to mention today 
is uh, the result of leadership from Justice Brian Curry of the Second District Court of Appeal, our former chair, Alan Steinbrecher, and Brandon Stallings, our colleague here on the board, and that is a task force on civility in the profession. Uh, the California Lawyers Association is taking the lead on organizing that project, and I hope I'm correct in saying that this is the first official joint project between the State Bar and the CLA since the sections, the former sections separated from the State Bar and became what is now the California Lawyers Association. Brandon will have more to say about this initiative during his RAD uh, report, and I look forward to that. Finally, I want to let you know that with regard to the search for a new executive director, Ruben has agreed to chair the search committee. At our next meeting, we will have a report to you on the full composition of that committee, uh, its status and its work plan for proceeding to find a new executive director. Uh, in the meantime, we are very glad to have Donna Hershkowitz continuing as our interim executive, interim executive director and providing uh, terrific service to our organization and our board and our board in that capacity. So with that, I think we are ready to proceed into our, uh, the rest of our agenda. Uh, the next item is a report from Donna, Executive Director's Report. Thank you, Sean. Um, I used the, um, the, my written report uh, that submitted with today's agenda as an opportunity to look forward, um, not very far forward, mostly looking forward to some of the important things that the board will be talking about later today. Um, but I wanna take this opportunity with my uh, verbal report to look backward, um, to highlight a few of the important events and activities since the board last met um, on September 24th and 25th. Um, so starting with a number of significant events relating to the admission to practice law. As Sean mentioned on October 5th and 6th, we conducted our first ever uh, remote online bar exam. We had somewhere in the neighborhood of 9,000 test takers taking the exam remotely. Um, the vast, vast, vast majority of which took the exam in their own homes or similar settings. Um, we, we actually had more than twice as many remote takers as the state with the next highest number of exam takers. And so it was really quite a feat to pull off in the short amount of time that we were given to prepare for this sea change in how we deliver the bar exam. Approximately 450 test takers took the exam at one of six hotel sites that we offered across the state. Unlike prior examinations, people were not in a big um, conference rooms or convention centers. Uh, those 450 takers each had individual hotel rooms in which to take the exam. Uh, more than half of those 450 were individuals who had reached out to us and asked for assistance to provide them quiet space where they could take the exam. They were taking it remotely online uh, like those at home, but simply did not, did not have secure quiet space in which to take the exam and that was provided for them. The remainder were those who had uh, types of testing accommodations which didn't permit the test taker to remain in front of the webcam at all times as, as is required for all remote takers. As Sean mentioned, we certainly never want technological issues to obstruct a person's ability to demonstrate their competence. And we, we have heard of some challenges that some applicants faced on exam day. Um, but I do want to report that we also heard from applicants who reported that their personal experience was flawless. Um, and as Sean noted, more than 97% of exam answers were uploaded or in the process of being graded. And um, we'll keep the board updated as we move through the grading process and the review of the, um, the, of the recordings of the exam takers, which are being used in lieu of the, online, the live proctoring that we normally had. Um, also on the admissions front, um, at the September board meeting, the board approved recommending uh, that the Supreme Court approve creating a provisional licensure program to address the, um, the fallout from the pandemic, the need to get working, the challenging situations that um, may have prevented some from feeling uh, in, a, in a place that they would be able to take the October exam. The rule um, was drafted to allow 2020 law school graduates or, or those who meet the eligibility requirements to sit for the bar in 2020 to practice law under supervision 
um, through as late as June 2022 uh, until they have an opportunity to take and pass the bar exam. The week following the board meeting in September, that proposal that was approved by the board was submitted to the Supreme Court. On October 22nd, the court adopted the rule and directed the bar to launch the program just three and a half weeks later on Tuesday, November 17th. Um, that was two days ago. I am happy to report um, that we were able to finalize the automation and to meet that launch date that was set by the Supreme Court. As of first thing this morning, uh, 527 applications have been started in the system. Uh, it looks like um, from my read about 150 or so of those 527 were fully complete and submitted for our review. Uh, 85 uh, have been found complete and have been approved in the first two days of the existence of the program. Um, just um, kind of a proud mama moment here. I'd like to share with you um, my screen, just a look at, um, at uh, one of the things that we have on our website, similar to the way that you would look up an attorney, we have a um, tool for looking up provisionally licensed lawyers and the supervisors who they are required to have in place in order to get licensed. Um, just as an example uh, for a search, I'm, I'm just gonna look for any provisionally licensed lawyer uh, or a supervisor of that lawyer who has a Q in their name, um, just to show you what this uh, feature looks like. So here you've got a listing of all of those uh, provisionally licensed lawyers. Um, just clicking on one, um, this is the information um, uh, about the, the provisionally licensed lawyer um, and the supervisor's name is here and the employer's address and firm uh, information is there. Similarly, if you click on the supervising attorney, um, then that takes you to the attorney profile and you see that as well. Um, I just wanted to share that piece with you because that was a sort of an add-on to the automation that we had to do to create the, the application process was to be able to provide individuals a way to take, to look up their provisionally licensed lawyer to make sure in fact that they are licensed, right? The same cautions that we would put in place for anybody to ensure that if you are securing a lawyer that you check to make sure that they are, their license is active. You can do that now with a provisionally licensed lawyer um, as well. Um, so, so that's, um, that's where we are so far with the provisional licensed lawyer program, um, but not sitting on our laurels, um, the provision licensed working group under the leadership of Highland Chen and Ruben Duran is actually meeting tomorrow, um, to discuss expanding the program because, you know, it's three days in, so it's time to expand. Um, so we are looking to, ex to expand the program and we'll be presenting a recommendation um, to the board at uh, an upcoming board meeting. So the same day that we launched this program on November 17th, um, the admissions office also administered, see I'm still talking about what we've done in admissions in September. Um, the admissions office also administered the first year law students examination, um, also conducted online uh, remotely. We had just a little over 300 test takers, I believe for that exam. Um, this was actually the second time, the second opportunity we've had to do the first year law students examination uh, remotely. Um, the first time being in June and not long after the pandemic took hold and we uh, first tried the, um, this, uh, using this online remote tool for the delivery of the exam. We had learned a lot of lessons from that first administration of the first year law students exam. Uh, we took those lessons to heart and we made changes when we delivered the October bar exam. Um, and then of course we further refined those in administering the exam earlier this week. Um, I, I think some of those changes were, were uh, obvious in among other things, um, the call volume for technical support um, during the that, uh, first year law students exam on Tuesday uh, was very low. Um, and we, um, we had gone to great pains to make sure that test takers understand how to access passwords, how to get, get um, online and, and download the, the uh, exam questions and the test was taken successfully. So um, because I've spent so long talking about admissions and highlighting sort of the 
sort of insane amount of work that they have been doing since the last board meeting alone. I just wanted to take this moment to publicly acknowledge the staff of the Office of Admissions who've been able to um, pull off all of these incredible feats in the past couple of months. And just so you know that, you know, they're not resting after the two days of the bar exam, um, they are um, preparing for the February exam. They are working on the grading for the October exam um, uh, and the review of the video recordings from the October exam as well. So just to bring you up to date on a couple of other activities since the last board meeting, um, <clears throat> Uh, we have or will have a number of important recruitments going forward. Sean mentioned the executive director um, recruitment. Um, um, we are nearing the finalization of a contract to begin the recruitment of the chief trial counsel. The um, search committee has been selected um, thanks to Brandon Stallings, Arnie Soul, Sean Seleg, and Judge Esther Kim, the chair of the Council on Access and Fairness, who will be uh, participating on the search committee for the chief trial counsel. Um, I anticipate noticing a meeting soon to kick off with the search firm as soon as the contract is finalized um, to set this off in the right direction. Um, we have, uh, we've also onboarded recently a new director for um, the Office of Access and Inclusion who I see is actually uh, uh, one of our attendees today. Um, many of the board members have had the opportunity um, to meet her, but some have not. Um, Andrea Fitanity started a month ago with the Office of Access and Inclusion, and she is off and running. Um, she comes back, comes to us with a legal services background, um, a pro bono background, and is jumping in feet first um, to the important work of the Office of Access and Inclusion looking at, at the, on the grant administration side, uh, policy on access issues and diversity and inclusion. So we are very excited to have Andrea with us. Um, on another front, the board and I, board leadership and I have been meeting with legislative leaders um, and those with interest in the work of the state bar. Those meetings will continue to be scheduled as we look for opportunities to partner and collaborate with the legislature on the important work that we do. And then of course, there's the day-to-day -day activity um, that just has been going on over the past couple of months here at the bar, the meetings of our sub entities that are continuing to work to implement our strategic plan. Um, we have been doing orientations for uh, a number of our sub entities um, for the new members whose terms just began at the conclusion of the board September meeting um, and more. Um, so as I was putting this list together and cataloging this work um, and I, I, I say, I will let you know that I've mentioned only just some of the big things that has, have been going on since, uh, since September. Um, but as I cataloged it all, I just I've realized how busy it has been. Um, and, um, and that makes me feel a little less troubled by the fact that I seem to rarely know what day it is anymore. Um, and I something that I find that's true among uh, others of my colleagues here um, in the leadership of the State Bar. With that, I turn it back to you, Sean, to lead the board through the rest of our agenda. All right, thank you, Donna. Um, Sean, it, yes. could I just, I, I kept looking for the little uh, clapping hands icon um, as Donna was talking about, <laughs> uh, in particular, the, the provisional licensure working group um, and and the, the launch of the program. I, I'm sure we all realize it, but I'm not sure if people watching the meeting realize that's an incredible number of uh, applications and uh, already licensed, uh, provisionally licensed lawyers. So truly, truly just to echo um, on my own behalf, hats off to the admission staff and to Donna and to Haylin for her wonderful leadership of that group. Thank you everyone. It's, it's tough times, but it's good to see people doing hard work. You're here. All right, thank you, Ruben. Okay, so uh, next on our uh, next on our plate is the consent agenda. Ruben has advised me that he wishes to pull off item 50-3, which is proposed changes to the conflict of interest code. Uh, so that will be removed from the consent agenda. Is there uh, any other item a board member would like to remove from the consent agenda? 
Hearing none, I will ask uh, Dag to take the roll on approving the consent items. Broughton. Yes. Ken. Yes. Ms. Neros. Aye. De La Cruz. Yes. Dylan. Yes. Duran. Yes. Go, uh, Ganong. Yes. LeBron. Yes. Petula. Yes. Stallings. Yes. Sowell. Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Ruben, would you like to address item 50-3? I will just ask uh, Vanessa or Brady to identify the issue. Yeah, Anything? Brady do that. We need, we need a revised um, resolution. Is, uh, has Brady been elevated to panelist? No, I think he needs to be let in. I saw him in the participants list. He is. I, he is I was, I'm just being elevated now. Can you hear me? There you yes. go. There you are. Hello, everyone. Um, and let me see if I can split, uh, get my screen to get the. Uh, so this was, uh, thank you, Ruben, for catching uh, uh, really just a Scrivener's error um, in attachment B to the resolution, which lists the various state bar uh, positions that are subject to the conflict of interest code. Um, one position, senior program analyst um, in, within the office of the executive director, um, uh, the attachment B failed to list the disclosure categories. So um, uh, the disclosure categories for that office are the, um, uh, uh, for the same as the others in that office. Those would be disclosures 2, 8, 12, and 13. Uh, so with that correction, I can offer a uh, amended resolution. All right. Uh, discussion or a motion from board members? Um, I'll move so it, please. Sure. And Dag, do you have the amended motion up? Uh, are you not seeing it? It's up. Um, I can see it. It's up. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I have moved by Duran. Second by Stallings. And seconded by Stallings. All right. Any discussion? Oh, Dag, please take the roll. Broughton. Yes. Chen. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. De La Cruz. Yes. Delen. Yes. Duran. Yes. Gnong? Yes. LeBron? Yes. Petula? Yes. Stallings? Yes. Phil? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you, Dag. Uh, all right, so that leaves on our open agenda uh, the reports from board committees and the 700 series of items for discussion. Uh, Brandon has a scheduling issue, so I am going to um, take the order, take these items in the following order. Uh, we will first hear a, a report from the Regulation and Discipline Committee, that's Brandon. We will then proceed to the items that relate to RAD while we still have Brandon available to us, which will be item 702 about the Discipline Commission and item 703 about addressing disparities in the discipline system. Uh, and then we'll go back to board committees and complete the agenda. So with that, uh, Brandon, can you please report uh, on behalf of the Regulation and Discipline Committee? Sir, just one right, second, one second, Brandon, before you get started. Um, Mr. Chair, did we take roll on the rest of the consent agenda? We did. Sorry about that. I'll mute myself. Always good to check. And by the way, thanks to Ruben for his sharp eye on that consent item. We appreciate that. All right, thank you, Chair, for your flexibility this morning. Um, I'm in trial right now, and there's just some scheduling issues that could not be resolved. So thank you for reshuffling some things. So as a part of the RAD uh, Chair report, I uh, just wanted to thank uh, everybody in the Office of Chief Trial Counsel uh, who's been working through this pandemic and uh, doing excellent work to ensure that uh, those here in California are um, are protected, that we continue to protect the public and litigate cases uh, in State Bar Court. I'd like to thank State Bar Court for their continued flexibility in uh, the implementation of, of the technology to uh, work towards justice in these uh, troubled times. Uh, we, uh, Vice Chair 
Uh, Highland Chin and myself continue to meet bi-weekly with leadership of OCTC and other entities to ensure that uh, various reforms are continued, continuing to be discussed, studied, and implemented. And so we look forward to talking about more of that in the ad hoc uh, uh, discussion. Regarding uh, Sean's comments about the civility task force, um, I did want to fl uh, flesh that out just a little bit. So in June of 2020, our immediate past chair, Alan Steinbrecher, approached me with an exciting project involving civility in the practice of law. Uh, Justice Brian Curry, uh, he's an appellate justice out of the Second District Court of Appeal, had contacted Alan and started a conversation about civility in the profession of law or the lack thereof. And Justice Curry wanted to take bold steps to address this growing problem. And with that in mind, uh, we formed uh, as co-chairs an exploratory group to discuss what could be done in this area. Uh, Chris Andreessen in the Office of General Counsel provided us with some excellent material and support involving past initiatives and ways uh, we could move forward in this area. And out of these initial meetings, we identified four uh, areas that we're going to look at and then potentially make recommendations to the Board of Trustees. And the first was, uh, and really the thought is that all of these uh, things, what one, one in particular is not going to uh, change civility here in California. Maybe it's all four or a combination of the four. And so uh, we want to look at every uh, aspect of uh, the civility uh, conundrum. But the first we wanted, area we wanted to look at was civility education and whether steps could be taken to change state bar rules to require at least one hour of MCLE dedicated to civility issues and explore the nexus between implicit and explicit bias uh, and uh, uh, in civil uh, communications between uh, counsel and then parties. Second, we wanted to look at exploring whether to require all attorneys to swear to the oath, which was changed in 2014 at the direction of past chair, Pat Kelly. And that oath uh, that has been in place since 2014 states Quote, as an officer of the court, I will uh, strive to conduct myself at all times with dignity, courtesy, and integrity. And certainly three things that um, are of, of utmost of importance. The third thing is perhaps the most ambitious and fraught with peril, uh, but I think that it deserves uh, to be discussed. And that is whether or not uh, a disciplinary rule a change could be made to enforce a civility rule of professional conduct. So there is significant case law on this issue, and COPRAC has been exploring that body of case law in regards to other issues, um, and they all involve First Amendment issues. So this area would be handled in a very thoughtful and deliberate manner and uh, discussed here at the working group. Lastly, judicial involvement would be explored in order to foster judicial efforts to promote or require attorney civility both in and outside the courtroom. So to this end, an amazing group of people was assembled, and I'm not even going to be able to mention everyone by name because it would consume a majority of this agenda, but uh, the individuals represented in part uh, by the California Judges Association, uh, CLA, CYLA, which is California Young Lawyers Association, ABOTA, ABTL, Council on Access and Fairness, Women's Lawyer Association of LA Bar, Committee on Professional Responsibility and Conduct, LA Bar Association, Bar Association of San Francisco and the Mexican American Bar Association and Cal Asian Pacific American Bar Association. So just to name a few. So earlier this month, Justice Curry, myself, Sean Seleg, and President of CLA, Amelia Veranini and uh, Vice President of CLA, Jeremy Evans, uh, we met and discussed CLA taking on and partnering with the State Bar in this initiative and making proposals to the Board of Trustees with those four goals in mind. Uh, CLA has graciously agreed to continue this work, and we look forward to further details and work from this task force and are excited to continue to work towards making the legal profession a place where civility and ethical uh, and excellent practice of law are valued above all else. So thank you for that extended uh, chair report, but I'm really excited about this. Uh, we have some incredible people working on it, and I think there's just a lot of really good buy-in uh, with uh, partners out in the legal profession. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, let's move to item 702 on our agenda, which is the Ad Hoc Commission on the Discipline System. I think uh, Ms. Chavez is going to present on that. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, my name is Lisa Chavez, and I'm the director of, of the Office of Research and Institutional Accountability, and I'll be presenting on item 702 today. Let me go ahead and share my screen. So this agenda item follows up on the September 2020 Board of Trustees meeting at which the board directed staff to develop plans to establish an ad hoc commission on the state bar discipline system in consultation with RAD leadership. So this item includes recommendation on the commission's charge that will guide the commission's work, size and composition. So um, background for this item, which was discussed at the September 2020 meeting, um, is that the Office of Chief Trial Counsel has gone, undergone uh, significant organizational and operational changes over the last uh, nearly 10 years. Uh, here's a list of the uh, big areas of improvements, areas of their OCTC that have um, improved access to the complaint system, enhanced operational efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in addition, the State Bar has undertaken a significant research and planning um, agenda to reduce discipline disparities. And so the thinking was is an ad hoc mission is needed to take a comprehensive look at the discipline system to explore uh, how this is going and to explore further changes that would address uh, the uh, efficiency of the system and uh, disparities simultaneously. So staff work with trustee leadership to develop the following charter that would guide this commission's work. So first and foremost, uh, the commission would take inventory of all the work that was discussed in the previous slide and identify a set of processes, policies, and procedures to focus on. And here's an example of the different areas of OCTC that this commission could consider focusing on, like they could focus on procedural justice, they could focus on operational efficiency, case prioritization, Etc. So that's one big piece of the charge. Next, the commission would evaluate its impact. So they would ask questions like, have these policies had their intended impact? What has been the impact on public protection? And in the process of doing evaluating the impact, they would review existing studies that the state bar has conducted and also commission new studies. And then finally, the ad hoc commission would recommend additional or revised forms. We recommend a 19 member commission that will be appointed by the Board of Trustees. Uh, members will reflect the state's demographic and geographic diversity and will be drawn from the following stakeholder categories. Here they are. So on the left is the stakeholder category and on the right is the number of members from that group. So as you can see two from Council of Access and Fairness, COAF, uh, one person from the California Medical Board, one person from Department of Consumer Affairs, California Lawyers Association, Association of Discipline Defense Council, National Organization of Bar Council, three people from the California criminal justice system, in particular, one prosecutor, one defense counsel, and one judge, two members of your board, uh, two people from the Office of Chief Child Counsel, two from State Bar Court, and two from Affinity Bar Associations. And, and Lisa, Lisa, sure. I'll, I'll just note that the agenda item makes clear that sort of that listing um, of number of members is intended as a guideline um, from which the members of the, of the commission uh, will be sought. It may be that, um, that a determination is made and will be brought back when we appoint the full committee that, um, that it makes sense to have more or less uh, than one of the individual, than the numbers that are set forth for the individual categories. So I just wanted to be clear that that is a, a guideline for us. And as we shape the full commission and see the skill sets that we have, um, the diversity of members, um, we will, um, there may be a slight modification to those specific numbers. Okay, thank you for that. So the timeline is, is that um, we would seat this commission um, early 2021. They would begin their work as soon as possible. And this commission would present a final report on its findings and recommendations no later than June 30th, 2022 with periodic status updates to this board. So we just recommend that you adopt this charter to guide the commission's work and you adopt the recommended composition. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um... Discussion questions from the board. 
or a motion. Sean, if I could, uh, just real quick. Yes. So in our discussions, um, at, as the uh, uh, RAD chair and vice chair, you know, some of the things that, uh, that we discussed regarding the composition was we wanted fresh thinking uh, as a part of the ad hoc committee. And that uh, we really believe should be paired with um, applicable experience in uh, the areas of public protection and uh, the justice system as a whole. So certainly no system is going to mirror the different issues that OCTC faces in, uh, in having fair and just prosecutions. But I think by compiling a larger group of individuals with various uh, disciplines and their background, um, I think that we can um, get a, a pretty good sampling of, of, of that fresh thinking and also um, on things that we can really use in the uh, uh, OCTC system. So um, I, I think that the uh, size is the size of the board or this, this ad hoc commission. Um, yeah, I think one of my concerns was that it would mirror the appendix I review. I know we all shudder at the appendix I uh, mention, uh, but yeah, I think as long as we proceed forward with uh, some of those ideals in mind and also just the pursuit of public protection as the paramount um, interest that we, um, that we look for here as a board, then uh, we're really excited to hear what this uh, commission has to offer. And with that said, I would uh, move the item. Just, I have a very quick question. Uh, Mark, before you ask your question, do we have a second on the motion? Just one, I'll second. Thank you, uh, Mark. Okay, uh, have the individuals um, for the com commission already been identified or is there gonna be some sort of application or sort of search um, process to, to fill those spots? I will toss that to Donna. There will be an application process, but I'll see if Donna wants to have more. Uh, yes. So, so we will do a we will do a solicitation the same way that we did for we are in the process of doing right now for um, the um, uh, Blue Ribbon Commission on the future of the bar exam, reaching out to those um, in the particular areas that are identified using connections to get the largest base of um, largest possible numbers of qualified ap applications in. And then we will review that and make a recommendation um, for the membership of the commission. Okay, any other discussion? Um, Brandon, I'm sorry, Sean, if I could just point out um, because um, a, a son like me may find the June 30, 2022 date jarring um, in that it's that it feels very far in the future. One of the things that I would expect from this commission is to it, in their periodic updates to the board to be bringing things forward that could be changing throughout um, as they are identifying issues. So we can be instituting uh, implementing changes throughout the process. I am not envisioning that we wait till to a final report on June 30th, 2022, and then begin implementing changes. Um, I think that there's a, there, there, there's a lot of opportunity for this commission to, um, to test, um, um, uh, to test different solutions, uh, determine effectiveness of those solutions, as the um, as the as the process moves forward, and I just wanted to to point that out. Good, thank you. Anyone else? All right, Dag, please take the roll. Rotten. Yes. Chen. Chen. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. De La Cruz. Yes. Delin. Duran. Yes. Ganong. Yes. LeBron. LeBron? Pertula. Yes. Stallings? Yes. Seoul? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. All right, Lisa, you're still on deck. Next is item 703, inflammation of implementation of changes 
to address disparities in the discipline system. Yes. Okay, first slideshow. Okay, <laughs> good afternoon again. Uh, this is item 703 and I'm pleased to give you an update to implementation of changes to that address disparities in the discipline system. In particular, this agenda item follows up on the July and September 2020 meetings, which the Board of Trustees directed staff to evaluate and implement changes recommended by Professor Robertson to address disparate, disparate in, um, discipline imposed on black attorneys. So as a reminder, here are the projects that uh, we've been working on for the last several months. Um, I'm just gonna give you an overview of the projects right now, and then I will methodically go through each one and give you an update to each. So uh, as a reminder, the project that um, <clears throat> involves archiving five years of closed complaints is motivated, motivated by the need to uh, essentially archive complaints that have been closed without discipline for more than five years to prevent them from being considered in evaluating and investigating a new complaint. The project on reportable action bank matters um, specifically today, my update involves <clears throat> updating you on the directive you gave us in September 2020 to for OCTC to explore a more robust and proactive preventive approach to attorneys who experience these matters that ensures, also ensures that public protection is not compromised. The project that involves encouraging respondent representation um, has three components. Uh, the first has to do with um, developing a letter that we would send to respondents, encouraging them of the importance, um, to understand the importance of a securing counsel. Um, we also were directed to develop a metric that would um, measure how successful we are in convincing attorneys to secure counsel. Um, and finally, um, we'll give you an update on our engagement with ADDC in this work, the Association of Discipline Dis Defense Counsel. And finally, uh, I'll give you an update on a piece of research we're doing that um, examines complaints not leading to discipline. Uh, this research, the purpose of this research is to inform the development of a proactive non-disciplinary system. And such a reform aligns with the work of the 2020 Governance and the Public Interest Task Force. So the project on archiving five years of closed complaints, I'm pleased to share that um, OCTC confirmed a few categories of cases that needed further consideration with RAD leadership. Once we learned, finalized all criteria for archiving places, um, we identified, staff identified and tagged nearly 400,000 complaints that satisfied that criteria. And I'm pleased to share that since this agenda item was published, the task of archiving all 400,000 close complaints has been completed. Uh, this was a very successful project collaboration between OCTC, my office, ARIA, and the Office of, Institution, office of Informational Technology. So next steps for this project is to finalize the automatic archiving of future closed cases. That is, as soon as cases hit the five-year mark, um, they've been closed without discipline and they meet all the criteria we identified, uh, they automatically get closed. Uh, with regards to the reportable, reportable uh, action bank matters, I have a few updates with this project. Uh, first is that OCTC revised the letters that uh, they sent out when attorneys um, face these, this issue. Um, these are the four letters here, a resource letter, a warning letter, a de minimis letter, and a closing letter. Each of these letters are described in the research in the agenda item. Um, a, a respondent will receive one of these letters depending on a particular circumstance. And OCTC recently reviewed all four of their letters and they made two key changes. Uh, first is that um, if you look at the resource letter, um, when they would send out that letter, it contained a set of resources. Um, so example include, here's information respondent about State Bar Client Trusting Accounting School, the handbook on client trust accounting, and say the phone number to the start State Bar Ethics Hotline. Um, OCTC took all those resources and added them to the other three letters. In addition, they enhanced all the resources and modified all the letters in the following ways. The descriptions of these resources have been expanded. They added additional resources. They added new warning language and they closed with information about the lawyer's assistance program. So you can see attachment A to this agenda item for what the newly revised closing letter looks like. And as I said um, before, 
little around 40 people, uh, 40 respondents on an annual basis. These are numbers, by the way, for 2019. On an annual basis, say 40 people, 40 respondents were receiving resources in the form of a letter. Uh, going forward, if these numbers still hold, uh, nearly 800 respondents on an annual basis will receive um, information with all these resources. We have initiated a process to capture the number of times that respondents open these letters because they receive them electronically. And we will also, um, initiate, we've also initiated the process to understand um, how we can capture the number of times they click on the different resource links that are embedded in these, in these resource, in these resource, in these letters. And the purpose of this is so that we can understand um, the extent to which people are, like which re resource they may resonate more than others. And that's all for the purpose of continuous improvement. And then finally, um, uh, the Office of Professional Competence has initiated a project with information technology to uh, explore in, um, incorporating an interactive attorney-client choice accounting self-assessment tool into the current learning management system. Uh, let me see my notes here. Oops, excuse me. Um, what's interesting about this project is that uh, you all approved this uh, uh, this project back in July, and it really dovetails nicely with this work on reportable action bank matters because, like, um, the first module that's going to be developed as part of the self assessment current the self assessment tool is the client trust accounting. Okay, so the next steps in this work is to develop a research plan to analyze the impact of all this work. And in particular, we'll be working with Professor Scalar um, on pilot testing alternative language to use in the letters. So for example, she has some ideas on if you incorporate, you know, a certain type of language may lead to certain different outcomes. And so we're really excited about that work. Okay, so finally, uh, the third project has to do with respondent representation the, and collaboration with the leadership uh, Rad and Professor Robertson staff developed an informational letter to distribute to respondents advising them of the importance of a securing counsel and directing them in particular to the Association of Discipline Defense Counsel. See attachment B for a copy of that letter. It is now being distributed to respondents. The letter is attached to the letters that OCTC sends to respondents that notifies them of an open investigation. For the purpose of researching whether this document has an impact on respondent securing counsel, the letter, as of now, is sent, being sent only to around half of respondents for the purpose of creating a control group and a treatment group. And we anticipate doing this experiment for about three to five months. Um, we've also finalized a metric per your request to measure the impact of, of, of this work. And our analysis shows that in 2019, 14% of attorneys have secured representation. And uh, going forward, we expect to be reporting this metric on a quarterly basis. So the next step in this work is to consider additional studies to analyze impact of this work. And we've outlined some of those ideas in the, in the agenda item. And we're going to, like I said, track and report the metric quarterly. And we're gonna continue engaging the ADDC a little update with regards to that, um, ADDC leadership is aware of the letter that we're distributing. Two in particular have read the letter and had a positive reaction. They have committed to reminding their members to ensure their contact information is correct, because like I said, that letter has a link to the ADDC. And discussions regarding uh, them offering pro bono services are ongoing. So finally, a little update with regards to the research on dismissed complaints. Um, we generated some preliminary analyses. Um, we did an analysis of nearly 60,000 original matter cases that were closed without discipline between 2015 and 2019. And we found that nearly two thirds were closed in the intake stage. Among these cases that were closed in intake, on average, these cases had around 2.8 allegations per case. And nearly 70% of the allegations related to either performance, interference with justice, or duties to client. Our next step in this work is to really um, understand these three categories more deeply and create some like subcategories within each for the purpose of sharing these results with Professor Scalar, who will review the results and recommend um, interventions to explore and pilot test. 
and our goal is to report the results of this analysis and her recommendations at the January meeting. Lisa, I, I want to interrupt just for a brief moment because um, uh, Bridget Grammy of the Center for Public Interest Law at the University of San Diego mentioned a, 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 a program in the UK that um, has to do with dealing with cases that are closed without discipline, cases that fall short of um, disciplinable conduct and yet clearly represent some level of dissatisfaction by an attorney's client, enough dissatisfaction to file a complaint with the state. I think that this is a very important project and it's, it's a little amorphous. It's easy to look at it and say, looking at these cases that are dismissed at intake, why would you do that? These represent a lot of work for OCTC to close. And then they represent, a, I think, a great deal of dissatisfaction on the part of the public in terms of having a, filed, taken the effort to file a case and seeing it closed by the state bar and feeling like they weren't heard that perhaps their concerns weren't taken seriously. So I, I wanted to just highlight this particular case because it's a it's an interesting project. And it, uh, as I indicated, I think it seems a little amorphous when you first look at it, but I think that what Bridget Grammy was pointing to um, is the type of thing that Ms. Sklar also works on related to looking for alternatives to resolution of these cases that fall short of disciplinable conduct, but that actually have a, a complaint that um, the state bar might find a way to be more responsive to. Thank you for that. Okay, so our recommendation is that the Board of Trustees just direct staff to continue working on these projects and to give you an update at their next meeting. Um, but before uh, we open up to questions, I wanna bring Dag in to review an issue related to the Reportable, Reportable Action Bank Matters project. Yes, and if I may, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little more long-winded again here, just briefly. I wanted to because I wanted to point to these three items related to the disproportionate discipline that uh, Lisa was reviewing: the archiving of cases that were closed without discipline, the reportable action bank matters, the resource letters that have been developed for that, and then the encouragement for attorneys to get representation. Each one of these items was found in the Farkas report to be a mechanism that appeared to contribute to disproportionate discipline among African-American attorneys. So I just wanted to back up and just, just emphasize again the big picture as to why we're looking at these specific issues. Each one of these was determined through the statistical modeling to be a mechanism that appeared to fall more heavily on African-American attorneys. The fact that African-American attorneys got more complaints lodged against, against them led us to look at what we can do with these cases the complaints that come in, but that are closed without any discipline. And so the decision was made that, you know what, we can take these in much the same way that in a criminal context, you would expunge um, old cases, you would expunge closed cases, you would expunge low level cases. What we found was a mechanism for archiving these so that they're no longer part of the record after five years. Prior to five years, they may represent some portion of some part of a pattern that OCTC needs to be able to evaluate. But after five years, these cases will disappear from view when someone is first re reviewing, when an OCTC attorney is first reviewing a, uh, a new complaint against an attorney, they won't have the potential bias that would be in, inserted into the system by seeing these closed complaints um, in the record. So that archiving case of almost 400,000, well over 400,000 of these closed complaints is a very important um, achievement in this effort to address the question of disproportionate discipline. The reportable action bank matters, similarly, there was a disproportionate number of these reportable action bank matters filed against African-American attorneys. In looking at this, what we found is that um, these are valuable insofar as the low level reportable action bank matters do appear to point to future misconduct, even though it may not be related to the lower level reportable action bank matter itself. But what we also found was that the vast majority of these cases, and Lisa showed a slide there, the vast majority over, it was something like 600 of these cases just in the last year, they get closed without any, informa any additional information or resources being provided to the attorneys. They're just low level matters. It, it, it was a, a, an innocent error. But what our statistical modeling showed was that these innocent errors often are an indication of some other challenge within the practice that down the road will lead to, to a problem with the discipline system. And so by taking this information and using it not punitively, 
but rather using it as a way of providing resources to attorneys in advance to say, look, this could become a problem down the road, you should be aware of it. And the State Board has resources to help you address it. We felt that this is a very important way of pushing out that information and providing a sort of prophylactic approach in these cases, um, rather than a punitive approach. And, and I think, again, as I mentioned with Ms. Grammy and the work that she's doing, that this is a, 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 an, an area where you're looking at something that's short of misconduct, but that you can still be proactive in seeking to avoid misconduct in the future. The final item here um, on the representation of um, attorneys, we found that um, African-American attorneys were less likely to be represented by counsel. Um, we do not have uh, the equivalent of a public defender system, as you're aware, and the uh, within the state bar discipline system. However, we can encourage attorneys to become represented when they find out that they are under investigation by the state bar. And so that's, that's the work that's being done on that piece. Now, returning to what Ms. Chav has asked me to discuss, which was the, the question of the reportable action bank matters. Uh, it was raised um, in a discussion uh, at a board meeting. The, the issue was raised about whether we should be looking at changing the rules of professional conduct to allow attorneys to leave a small amount of money in their trust accounts, put their own money into the client trust account so that it would, it would provide a cushion against overdrafts and then prevent the overdraft that results in the bank reporting to the uh, Office of Chief Trial Counsel that there was an overdraft. Staff recommended against that at the time because we felt like these, these overdrafts did in fact provide this, um, this useful, useful information related to potential future misconduct. And we, um, we, we think that we have a good solution in terms of this preventative messaging and the provision of resources to attorneys related to the um, client trust accounting and how they might improve their uh, practice management. But I did want to raise it just verbally um, and point out that it had been raised at a board meeting. It did not find its way into a, a recommendation previously, but it was discussed. And I just wanted to, to full disclosure note that we had, we had discussed it, had not moved on that at this time and didn't, didn't, um, didn't think that we should, but we wanted to offer it back up to the board of trustees in case anybody had further thoughts about whether um, Office of Professional Competence or the uh, Commission on uh, Professional Competence and uh, Professional Responsibility and Conduct should be studying this issue. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Um, discussion? Okay. Um, not hearing any. Um, Lisa, I think there's a resolution you want to offer to confirm the board's commitment to action in this area. And so you now have it up on the screen and I would invite a motion. I'll move it, it's Ruben. It's Jose, I'll second. Thank you. Not hearing any more discussion. Uh, Deg, please take the roll. Rotten. Yes. Chin. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. De La Cruz. Yes. Dalen. Yes. Duran. Yes. Ganong. Yes. LeBron. Pritula. Yes. Stallings. Yes. Sewell. Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll now return to reports of board committees. Uh, we'll begin with item 110, which is the board executive committee, uh, uh, which I will report on. So we met this morning. Um, uh, uh, I've already reported in my chair's report about the action the executive committee took uh, prior to today on appointments. Um, this morning we discussed principally a uh, finalization of a rule of rules of procedure about the implementation of the monetary sanctions statute in the discipline system. Um, there was comment from the Association of Discipline Defense Council uh, about the policy behind that statute and whether it's consistent with the overall purpose of the discipline system, which is uh, according to case law, not to punish attorneys, but to protect the public. 
And uh, I just want to note this for the board that this is exactly the kind of policy issue that can be brought before the new ad hoc commission on the discipline system. And of course, uh, any change in that regard would require statutory change. But from a policy standpoint, that commission can, can look at that issue and decide if that's something that they want to recommend that the bar pursue. Um, so that's it for the board executive committee. Uh, Josh, can you report on finance committee, please? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually do not do not have a report at this time. Um, we will um, have one in the January meeting. Okay, thank you. Next up is Sonia for audit committee. Uh, yes, thank you. We don't have a, a lot, but we did have a kickoff meeting. The audit committee had a kickoff meeting with Mason's Gill and O'Connell as our independent um, audit firm and talk about the scope and schedule of the 2020 fiscal audit. And we will meet again in December for the, to prepare the uh, complete uh, audit, the 2021 audit committee work plan that we will present to the January board meeting. That's it. Okay. All right. Thanks to both of you, Josh and Sonia and your committee members for keeping the finances in order. Uh, let's move now to item 701, proposed rules for law school accreditation. Who is presenting on this item? Item 701. Uh, right there, Audrey Ching and Natalie Leonard will be promoting them right now. All right. Natalie, we see you, but your mic appears to be muted and same with you, Audrey. I think that I'm open now. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Hello. Uh, well, um, I'd like to start by saying good afternoon to the members of the Board of Trustees. I'm Audrey Ching, the Assistant Director for Admissions. And I'd like to introduce uh, Natalie Leonard, our Principal Program Analyst for Law School Regulation. Um, I'm actually going to turn it over to Natalie to discuss the proposed rules for law school accreditation. Natalie? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to address the board on this project. I uh, have been working with uh, the staff, with the Committee of Bar Examiners and the CS Bars on this project, and we're happy to present to you this recommendation from the Committee of Bar Examiners for a new rule set to replace the accredited law school rules um, and to request that you would post uh, this proposal mm -hmm. for a period of 60 days and to consider adopting it going forward. Um, if adopted, it is proposed by the Committee of Bar Examiners that it would be um, operational in July and uh, have a two-year phase in for the schools so that they could have a period to come into compliance with, with the new elements. Just a moment. Um, some of you may not be familiar with the additional types of law schools uh, here in the state of California. Uh, in addition to the types of law schools that are approved by the American Bar Association, uh, the state of California also has two additional pathways for law school. The first being registered and accredited law schools and the second being accredited law schools. Most schools would start out in the registered posture and then after establishing um, a history and a minimum pass rate that could meet the accredited standards, uh, they could consider accreditation. And the rules that we're talking about today are specifically um, in that accreditation area. And if you would give me just a moment, I am having a brief technical difficulty. I'd like to bring up uh, note that I'll be discussing. Okay, uh, so in terms of the process, this project came about because it was a request from the board who was reviewing the operation of accredited law schools and asked, uh, asked the committee of bar examiners to work with a new body, the CS bars, to address a couple of things. Uh, the first one is to review the rules to incorporate the best practices in accreditation as the rules had not been updated in a significant way in a long period of time. And also to undertake a second initiative 
to allow schools that have earned an institutional accreditation to be recognized in the state of California if they also meet a specific programmatic requirements that are important to the state bar. The CS bars uh, was based on a prior commission, but it was broadened in its mission to include both members of deans of registered schools, accredited schools, members of the committee of bar examiners, and also an accreditation expert who has had experience on the ABA's council, um, as well as several state bar projects, and so had a deep familiarity in that area. Uh, the committee began meeting in April of 2019, uh, by interviewing a number of um, institutional accreditors and reviewing the accreditation practices of seven institutional accreditors and seven programmatic accreditors. A programmatic accreditor would be related to a specific project such as a specific practice area such as architecture, uh, dentistry, two different uh, boards related to medicine, etc. Um, and of course, the American Bar Association was included as well. After completing this review, the CS bars identified and the Committee of Bar Examiners endorsed four key purposes for accreditation. The first of these is consumer protection and transparency, making sure that uh, both consumers and prospective students and current students understand the rights, responsibilities, and limitations of attending uh, one of these schools. Uh, the second is student success, providing the materials that students need in order to get a quality legal education to prepare them for practice. Uh, the third is particularly interesting. Uh, there is a new section that was not part of the rules before involving diversity, equity, and inclusion. This has always been a bedrock purpose uh, for this uh, group of schools as well as the registered schools, but it had never been codified in the rules before. And one thing that the group noticed is that every other professional accreditor did have uh, such a section of the rules. So the CS bars worked together with the Office of Access and Inclusion and the Council on Access and Fairness in order to create a specific section for the first time. Uh, we don't think this is a new area of consideration for the schools, but it is important to make a specific statement as to that. Uh, and this section will require schools to have a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan uh, to review and to respond to that plan in a mission appropriate manner. Um, the final element is, of course, preparation for licensure uh, and dovetailing with um, member Stallings uh, initiative on civility, also preparing students, uh, preparing the students for professionalism and ethical practice um, in the law. The rules were reviewed against these four purposes and they were slimmed from a 75 page package down to a 25 page package uh, that places all of the guidelines together in uh, the rules together in one place, makes it easy for the public to understand, easy for the schools and students to understand as well. Uh, second, the rules were reviewed to make sure that they included only rules that are related specifically to those purposes. So a number of rules that required specific actions by the schools but didn't necessarily contribute to these important outcomes uh, were removed to better focus the committee's time. Uh, finally, uh, the group reviewed the accreditation and non-compliance process. The accreditation process remains largely similar uh, the non-compliance process was adjusted to allow schools an opportunity to provide full information up front. If there is a potential issue of non-compliance, uh, they may do so in written form, they may do so in hearing form, they su may submit multimedia evidence uh, so that when the committee is making an action, uh, taking an action, it can do so based on full information up front. Uh, the current process is stepwise. Uh, the committee learns a little bit more at each step and they wanted a holistic process to make a higher quality decision uh, in a quicker manner. After the CS bars created its proposal, uh, working with staff, the areas in which staff differed uh, from the committee uh, were placed into a separate alternative staff proposal and these were presented to the committee of bar examiners. Uh, the committee took this project very seriously and appointed uh, 
pair of committee members to review uh, carefully the proposals to consider and ultimately create this final proposal after consulting in a question and answer session with some of the members of CS bars. As a result, uh, you see a single proposal here in attachment A that the committee recommends for proposal. And for reference in attachment B and C, you can see the differences uh, between the CBE's ultimate recommendation and where the proposal started with CS bars. Um, at this point, uh, Audrey, is there anything that you would like to add? No, thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. And if there so are this is, please. Oh, this is uh, Brandon Stallings. Uh, so, um, and something that triggers uh, this this question uh, relates to an MCLE that I attended earlier this week, and it had to do with the use of of uh, various methods of legal education in California to increase diversity in the profession. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rachel Johnson Farias, uh, she's the founder of a program that works with individuals to uh, to place them in apprenticeship opportunities uh, with lawyers and with judges. So um, low-income students can study under lawyers and then uh, potentially go on to practice law after sitting for the baby bar and then the, uh, um, and then the California bar. Um, what, one of the prevailing themes of the presentation was that uh, one of the greatest hindrances to diversity in the practice of law is a legal education that for some people is just too expensive and is something that either a they can't take on or uh, or are unable to take on that debt load and so one of the benefits of the cal registered and then the um and the uh, cal accredited schools is that they're able to keep their overall costs a little bit lower uh, due in part to lower accreditation fees and so my question is is there a mechanism to determine like, how much fees are going to increase for schools? And is there a mechanism to make sure that they're not increased to deny individuals that, um, you know, the, the potential to attend a law school? Well, um, I, would, I would point to a number of things. Uh, the specific costs are not mandated um, in the proposal, but it is a value that was used to create these rules. And part of the reasons the rules were slimmed were to give the schools maximum flexibility um, with uh, in the most efficient package possible. And as a result, it is true, Brandon, you see extremely different price points in the registered and accredited area. Um, there are schools uh, whose tuition is as low as $4,000 per year. Uh, the other thing that's true is that with offering a larger number of modalities of teaching in these schools, um, another element of cost is just really the time you must take from your career or your family or to move to another geography. Being able to take a longer program or take a program that is online, allowing you to continue with your schooling or your travel or your home care is an ultimate decrease in the cost as well. So it is... Um, it is not um, clear that the state bar could mandate a particular cost, but many of the choices are designed to provide a modest cost education for students, absolutely. Great, thank you. All right, any more discussion? Uh, Donna, I think you're muted. Uh, Donna, about, are you trying to talk? Uh, there you go. Sorry about that. There's a weird thing that goes on with my volume in Zoom. Um, so just wanted to uh, point out one thing. Uh, Natalie had mentioned that the committee of bar examiners were um, looking at a um, July 2021 implementation date and also a, um, a two-year uh, uh, phase-in period for, for these uh, rules. The, the phase-in period is not um, set forth in the rules themselves, so I think that will be something that when these rules come back after public comment, we will um, ask the board to make an affirmative decision on um, the time period for the phase-in. Um, also, I think it's premature to uh, talk about what an effective date for the rules 
might be. It doesn't say it anywhere in the proposal. It was just, as Natalie said, something that the committee of bar examiners thought would be appropriate. Um, the reason why I think it's premature is um, we need to put these rules out for public comment. Um, the state bar rules are pretty um, uh, strict when it comes to what kinds of changes could be made after public comment that would not require it to go out again. Um, I would find it, I'd be surprised if these rules wouldn't go out for a second public comment after receiving input from the law schools and potential law students and law students who, who are interested um, in this. And so I think we won't have enough information about, um, uh, about uh, implementation date until after that, that proposal, um, uh, that process runs, it, runs its course. Um, and then I would also um, I would also just note that um, um, I, uh, along with Natalie and Aud Audrey, strongly encourage the the board to uh, move to circulate the proposal for public comment. Um, a lot of work has gone into this. A lot of of blood, sweat, and dare I say tears of members of the committee of state bar accredited and registered schools staff and the committee of bar examiners as well. Um, digging in, rolling up their sleeves, trying to um, uh, mesh the differences between the staff thoughts and the Committee of State Bar Accredited and Registered Schools thoughts on this. Um, I do. I did notice in sort of taking a final review of this uh, again last night that there are some grammatical issues um, in the in the rule proposal itself. And so, should the board uh, move to to circulate this? Uh, proposal uh, for a public comment period. I'd like to just make the caveat that that would be um, subject to clarification of simply those grammatical issues um, by staff prior to it prior to it being circulated. Okay, with that suggestion, do I hear a motion? This is so hard sorry. To, I'll move. That I'm here, second. I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch who moved. Jose. Jose moved and second from? Dylan. Seconded. All right, unless there's any further discussion, Dag, please take the roll. Rotten. Yes. Chen. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. De La Cruz. Yes. Dylan. Yes. Duran. Yes. Ganong. Yes. LeBron. Gratula. Yes. Stallings. Yes. So. Yes. Motion carries. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll go to item 704, appointment of chair for the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group. Uh, Linda Katz. Are we expecting Linda or? I, I just found her in uh, the attendees okay. list and I just All promoted right. her. So we are. Uh, and Linda, I see you on the screen. I see your name on the screen and you will need to turn on your microphone and your camera. Okay. Yes. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Linda Katz with the uh, uh, the Mission Advancement and Accountability di Division. Um, and as the agenda item before you explains, your board created the paraprofessional program working group initially in January, and then in March appointed Chris Iglesias as the chair of that working group. And under Chris's leadership, the full working group met seven times and we had numerous meetings of subcommittees that dug into the detailed work that needs to be done to develop a proposal to bring back to you. As you're aware, Chris Iglesias, because of other commitments has no longer uh, been able to remain as either on the board of trustees or as chair of the working group. 
Um, but fortunately, Justice Petru from the First District uh, Court of Appeals has agreed to serve in this role. She has a real interest in this work. Um, prior to being appointed to the First District Court of Appeals, she was uh, a judge at the at Alameda Superior Court where she heard cases that really uh, dealt with the issues that the paraprofessional program is looking at, including family law cases. She's really interested. She's been in the background um, observing some of the meetings. And so we're really happy to have her join. The other, um, so we're looking to have her, have you approve her appointment as chair. The other two items that we're asking for your board's approval for are um, an increasing the number of seats on the, on the working group. We want to expand the working group to allow for more input from other judicial officers who are sitting and hearing these types of cases, as well as from legal services programs. These are potentials. We, uh, we're not asking to um, limit who those voices would be. These are just examples of who we're seeking to ask for appointments. So we want to ask uh, for the board to delegate to the new chair the appointment of the additional members. And we also, in light of the transition to the new chair, and as well as bringing new members up to speed, we want to ask for an extension of the deadline for submitting the final report to your board to the end of September of next year. All right, thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. Any discussion or questions? And if not, I'd welcome a motion. So Jose, again, I'll make the motion. Thank you. Christine, second. All right, uh, Dag, please take the roll. Rotten. Yes. Chen. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. De La Cruz. Yes. Delenn. Yes. Duran? Yes. Ganong? Yes. LeBron? Bertula? Yes. Dollings? Yes. Sowell? Yes. And the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Donna's going to lead us in some brainstorming about our strategic planning session in January. If I can ask, um, we have uh, among our attendees, if you can raise your hand, Melanie Lawrence and Michelle Crampton, um, so we can uh, sweep them out of the attendee group and uh, include them as panelists. Wonderful, thank you for that, Dad. Um, so I wanted to- I wanted to take the opportunity to um, brainstorm with all of you about the January planning session. Um, as we uh, mentioned uh, in a couple of, uh, of the last couple of board meetings, uh, primarily the last meeting, um, the planning session is going to look a little different than we um, have had it in the past few years. Um, and uh, there, there's a, um, there are several reasons for that, but largely um, it's because we are in the lab, we will be in the last year of implementing the strategic plan. And um, our plates are frankly full. Um, there is quite a lot of work, important work to be done to complete the elements of the strategic plan, as well as other work that is going on that isn't even reflected on the strategic plan itself. Um, as a result, and I've had some conversations with board leadership about this, we were thinking that the planning session might be a great opportunity not to discuss new objectives to add to the plan, but rather to do some level setting um, for the board and also to bring folks up to speed on some important issues that will be coming to you throughout the year. Um, so, um, so the thinking um, has evolved as follows. Um, one of the items that it would be helpful, we believe, to 
um, have the board start in really engaging in is um, the work of the paraprofessional working group. Um, the paraprofessional working group was preparing, they had had on their agenda for some time that they would be presenting an update to the board, a status update to the board at the January meeting. And this really seems like a good opportunity for the planning session to really hear about the work that they're doing, the direction that they're heading in, and, um, and uh, for the board to engage with, um, with them um, to help set direction, to understand where they're going, to make sure um, that the board is um, sort of doing a, a course correction if necessary. I don't anticipate one will be, but really doing um, um, a sort of a midstream discussion of the direction that the, that the group is heading in. Um, I think this is also a good opportunity being that we spent some real time at last year's planning session um, hearing about paraprofessional programs and and getting updates from the state of Washington on the program that they had. And that was what um, was the precursor to the board kicking off this new paraprofessional program working group. So that's one of the things that, that I think would be useful um, for the board. Um, another thing that, um, that, Sean and Ruben, um, that Sean and Ruben and I had talked about was, um, was maybe some level setting on the attorney discipline system. Um, as we launch the ad hoc commission on the attorney discipline system, which will be doing a comprehensive review in areas primarily around OCTC and a little bit on the state bar court, um, maybe having some more in-depth discussions um, with OCTC and the state bar court and, and learning about their processes may, might be valuable. Um, as well as Dag had mentioned uh, in his um, uh, discussion earlier, um, we also, it's also an opportunity to hear not just about the attorney discipline system as it operates today, but ways it could operate in the future. Um, hearing from Professor Tara Sklar about proactive uh, risk-based regulation and things that we might be doing differently going forward. Because we have um, recently, uh, uh, I think as recently as yesterday for part of it, um, we've just done some training for the new newest board members on the pieces of the attorney discipline system. Um, I certainly want to make sure that um, that what we present to you is valuable for the board, um, is, um, is something that will give you the, the base level of information needed for you to participate um, in um, with the ad hoc commission as they make presentations for you, to you for you to understand um, what direction you would like to to set them off in and, and help them as they shape their recommendations. Um, so those would be sort of the two sort of main items as part of a public strategic planning session. Um, and then the other thing that I'm recommending is um, is that we do a training, um, that we have just a, a, a pure training for the board. Um, uh, the issue of implicit bias may be a, a fabulous one to roll out um, for board training. We did a training for uh, the members of, of the, our sub entities um, uh, October last year um, and rolling something like that out for the board, I think would be, um, uh, would be beneficial. And it's something that we should put into a, um, annual or biennial um, uh, training um, um, protocol to ensure that we all remain um, trained on topics, uh, important topics such as that. Um, so the reason I asked Michelle and Melanie to be here is sort of part of that brainstorming on if you all agree that attorney discipline system um, level setting would be helpful, part of the brainstorming of figuring out what that would be, um, Melanie and Michelle can sort of help um, uh, help you understand sort of what training has been done recently and, and can respond to any of your questions about what training they might be able to provide. Um, so with that, I really, I really do intend this not as a, as a presentation, um, but as a brainstorming session. So I do want to turn it over to all of you to talk about whether those things make sense, if there are other things that we should be doing, if we do agree on the attorney discipline system, what that training, um, what that level setting um, might look like to be most valuable to the board. Yeah. 
Sean or Ruben, since you, um, since we sort of the three of us engaged in a little bit of that pre brainstorming together, I don't know if you had any comments. Yeah, I see Sean's screen maybe frozen. I can't tell. I saw the. Oh, the no. uh, Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. I'm just being slow and steady. So, yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, in terms of the, the, the discussion of the discipline system, I think we don't want to be redundant of things that people already know. But on the other hand, um, I think it's uh, most people come to the board without a deep background in the discipline system. And so given that we're getting ready to have a deep dive into that, uh, both in connection with the discipline commission and the other ongoing work that we just heard about, uh, we think it would be useful. But if there's if you, what would be useful uh, now or later as well, is if there are things about the discipline system you're curious about that you don't understand, that you would like to have more background on, all of these things would be, would be valuable to us in setting up a session that would be most useful for the board. Hey, Sean, this is Brandon. So, uh, one of the things that you and Alan set up with grad chair and vice chair uh, was to get uh, various types of training from members of OCTC um, and to walk through diff different elements of their job and to see really what, what work goes into um, investigating a case and prosecuting a case. And so I don't know if there's a way to, to incorporate that into uh, the planning session, because I think as trustees, you know, if we're looking at, at potentially making changes in the justice system. One of the best ways uh, to do that is to, first of all, understand uh, the work that goes into the cases and, and uh, you know, the type of training that uh, the state board does for our employees regarding implicit bias. Uh, and I think really demystify uh, some of these areas. So. I think anything that could give all trustees a, a better understanding of the nuts and bolts, you know, might be a little laborious, uh, but I think it would, for, from my perspective, it was very helpful. And that's coming from a criminal prosecution background, but just to see, um, you know, the various uh, factors that are unique to uh, to this type of licensing prosecution were, were really helpful for me to wrap my mind around these some of these issues. Mark. Yeah, along those same lines, this was probably pre-COVID and all of that, but we used to have uh, a day where we do training down at the um, at the court and you'd go and talk to the judges and so forth and so on. And I thought that was very helpful as a new um, uh, board member, that particular event, but I know we can't do it, but I think that's what Brand's talking about, something along those lines, especially for people who are non-attorneys. I mean, those of us that are attorneys kind of have a at least a basic idea of what that discipline system is. But if you're not an attorney, you don't really know what it's all about. So that one day was, I thought was really good. If I'm an attorney, I would appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, hi, this is Juan. So I agree with uh, Mark and, and uh, Brandon. I think uh, uh, about a year ago, Donna, when she was running programs, she provided an overview of the programs and her department which is very, very helpful as a new trustee. And I think that, that providing these type of trainings for a trustee, I think it's critical as we move and continue to uh, make decisions that are gonna change the court. So I do agree with that. Sean, this is Ruben. I'll just jump in to echo yeah. what most folks have said. Um, there's a lot of moving parts to our discipline system. And so uh, sometimes you just have to see some of them in action, even if only briefly, to sort of contextualize uh, what it is a lot of our, our folks do and what we're responsible for. And then we have the added benefit, of course, of these meetings are public. So um, it goes beyond the trustees, right? Even, even folks who tune in or, or watch the meeting at a later point, um, I think can get a better sense of uh, one of our main functions uh, as an organization. So. I think it'd be great. So what might make some sense then is to, um, since I love to volunteer you all, 
um, is um, for um, maybe Brandon and Highland as the chair and vice chair of RAD um, for, for staff to work with the two of you um, as we develop an outline for what the um, planning session would be on that um, on on that part of the uh, that part of the planning session on the attorney discipline system. So you can make sure you can help guide us in providing something that would be most valuable for the members. That works for me. Yeah, happy to do that. So one other thought that has occurred to me is, you know, Donna, you mentioned the the sort of proactive regulation issue, and that's something that we've talked about over the course of several years, and we spent some time at a strategic planning session um, hearing from a number of subject matter experts on it. Um, I do think we need to continue that discussion. I thought those discussions were valuable. I think that work we should continue to push forward on um, just so that all of the time and resources we've spent on the prior thinking and analysis isn't lost. Um, so there may be a way to work some of that into this. One thing that has occurred to me and that is a question that has always remained on my mind is to what extent does our discipline system sort of writ large, not just sort of like OCTC's processes in the weeds, but just taking a step back and looking at the big picture of, you know, these are the rules of professional responsibility. This is how enforcement happens. Is that doing a good job, big picture of protecting the public? Because to me, there's always the question in my mind, you know, I, as a law firm leader, receive reports from effectively our insurance carrier on these are the types of malpractice claims we're seeing, right? These are the types of professional liability claims we're seeing. These are the topics that come up all the time. Here are the areas of significant risk. Um, these are the types of issues that result in malpractice claims. There's not, you know, it's sort of like a Venn diagram. There is some overlap with respect to state bar discipline and those types of claims, um, but not entirely. And it's always been a question in my mind of, are there things that are that typically fall in that malpractice space that are or are not getting captured by state bar discipline? And if so, why not? Right? You know, if there's a rule covering it, is it that people don't typically bring complaints up for violations of those rules? And if so, why? Um, so I think that's a sort of like stepping back big picture question that I've always had in my mind, sort of what, why is there not this complete overlap with legal malpractice in state bar? And I know there's some good reasons for that, but I think there could be some, some gaps um, between the two. And it does, that also then makes me think of the proactive um, regulation issue. Are there ways in which we can be mitigating risk? And I, I do think that the sort of the, uh, the, the bigger question there of, are we, you know, are we doing what we need to do in the name of public protection? Is what we are doing in the name of public protection? That is, uh, that is a sort of core part of what the ad hoc commission will be looking at, um, right? They are looking at fairness and effectiveness, um, fairness, looking at procedural fairness, and looking at um, disparity um, as well, um, but not solely. Um, and taking taking a look at, you know, making sure that the that the processes and procedures and the sort of the overarching philosophy that we have and how we did we discipline attorneys is designed to result in public protection. Yeah, Eileen, I think that's a really that's a really good observation. So I think that would be a useful discussion to have. So you know, one thing that comes to mind that would be worthy of discussion is under the disciplinary rules. Um, in California, like every other jurisdiction in the country that I'm aware of, competency issues like just providing incompetent representation is generally not a basis for discipline. It has to be uh, repeated, uh, reckless, maybe intentional, something else. So just your garden variety, the lawyer made a mistake is uh, one time is not a basis for discipline. Um, but there are other issues, you know, we might, um, uh, uh, do a little bit differently than, than, the, than the discipline day that the board used to have, which is to talk about enforcement priorities and the types of, so you're going to the types of issues that the discipline system addresses as opposed to legal malpractice. And that also gets into what are the enforcement priorities for the office and how do they categorize uh, cases in terms of priority. I mean, we've talked about that in terms of the case prioritization system, but this might be a bigger picture way of looking at that too. Um, 
So yeah. I think those are things that we really should try to tee up for the board during this session. I don't know if this is related, but uh, I'm talking about things that have bothered me over the last few years on discipline is this notion of backlog. And I know, I don't mean this to be a critique of Melanie or, or uh, OCTC or anything, because I know they've done a great job with reorganizing the, um, uh, the office and, and taking care of this. But there still seems to me to be this archaic definition of what that is. And we, the bar, seem to be behind that eight ball all the time. And it may be time to maybe take a look at that particularly with respect to these complicated cases. For example, the, um, the one that we just finished uh, that took years and years and years. And anybody who knows that does any kind of work like this, like public defender or DA or anything, where you're handling cases like that, there are some cases that you can manage in a very short period of time. And there are other cases that are very complicated and complex and need to fall under sort of a different definition. And I've always thought that the way that the statutes define this don't account for um, the complexity of what they have to do on a number of occasions. So that may be something that we want to look at as well. Good. Yes, and certainly <coughs> because uh, that definition is something that we have um, we have explored um, uh, and engaged in discussions with the legislature on in the past and it's also one of the reasons that we have made um, we've gone to great pains the past couple of years in the annual discipline report really to um, talk about um, certainly we're reporting on on backlog as that is what is required statutorily for us to do but to really talk about um, uh, what to to sort of show a different a, a, under a different lens of what our efforts are and toward, be, toward protecting the public. And that isn't just looking at sort of a hard and fast deadline of what the backlog is, but the cases that really do impact public protection the most. Um, and, and that's why the, the uh, if you take a look at say three years of annual discipline reports, you'll see a significant change in how they're structured to address those kinds of issues. Okay. Well, I think this has been uh, this has been useful. Um, Donna and uh, Melanie and Michelle, is there anything else that would be useful to you from the board in planning for this session? Uh, not for me. I think those are some really great topics that we can dig into. Okay, good. Great. And and I know Michelle and I had talked earlier and. And she felt like the um, the training that was given to the new trustees really was the tip of the iceberg in terms of what the court could be um, sharing um, with the with the trustees and giving them a baseline understanding of all of the the hard work of the state bar court. Um, so yeah, I think this sets us sets us up in a really great direction. Good. All right, so I think we've got a good plan for January. Uh, I want to thank everyone for your attention and thought today. This will complete our open session agenda. Uh, we will now move into our closed session agenda. Dag has sent the board members the link. Uh, it's one, uh, it's almost 115 now. Let's, uh, let's plan to take a five minute break and we'll convene the closed session uh, at 120. So I will see you in the other Zoom room.
before we conclude our meeting. Yes, yeah, so, so going back to the executive director report, um, I just wanted to um, inform you that we received the administrative order um, from the Supreme Court while we were in closed session. Uh, the court's order regarding the, the um, administration of the February 2021 bar exam uh, reads in relevant part as follows. The general bar exam will be administered online as a mostly remotely delivered exam over two consecutive days on Fe Tuesday, February 23 and Wednesday, February 24, 2021. Utilizing reasonable pandemic related precautions, the general bar exam will be administered in person at the discretion of the state bar to those applicants granted testing accommodations that cannot be effectively provided and securely administered in a, rem a remote environment and for those, other, for those with other extenuating circumstances that require them to take the test in person rather than remotely. In other words, the Supreme Court is directing us to do much as we did for the October exam, have it mostly remote and online with limited in-person testing for those whose testing accommodations don't lend themselves to remote a, a remote test, test environment and for those with extenuating circumstances that require an in-person um, assistance for quiet space, for example. Um, so that was just released by the court um, this afternoon. Okay, thank you, Donna. And with that, uh, we are adjourned. See you next time.